the kind introduction. Um, thank you to the organisers for inviting me and some other colleagues from London to be at your conference. We're delighted to be here. Um, I've got no disclosures of interest. Um, so I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. I work for London's Air Ambulance, uh, or was formerly known as London HEMS. Um, so we're a service um, operating by helicopter in the daytime and using rapid response cars um, in the hours of darkness. And we respond to trauma patients who are injured within the M25, which is the motorway running around the outside of London. We do about 2,000 missions a year, and this year is our 30th birthday, and very soon we will treat our 40,000th patient. Um, so that's what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Um, the service, as you can see, is a relatively tight team compared to working inside a hospital. And you can see here the pilots, fire crew, and the doctors and paramedics. The other part of my job is a consultant in emergency medicine at the Royal London Hospital, which is in Whitechapel in the east end of London. Um, it's well known for being on a strip of road called Murder Mile because Jack the Ripper used to operate in that area. Um, you can see here the building is a huge, big two-storey, um, two-tower block in, in East London. And it's aff closely affiliated with our university, Queen Mary's University of London, where a lot of research happens and there's a lot of um, cross-working with the clinical teams within the building. So as a trauma centre, we see over 3,600 trauma calls a year. Of that, about 1,800 are admitted to hospital, and of those 700, 700 will have an injury severity score of more than 15, meaning they're very seriously injured. Now, we have a problem in London, in that trauma workload is going up for all of the reasons you can see here. And it's estimated that over the next 10 years, our workload will increase by up to 40%. So we have to ensure that we are continuously improving, not just to deliver clinical care, but to ensure that our systems, processes, um, and our services are able to cope with this potential increase in demand. Now, we've been talking during the conference about Luke Smith, um, but I think Luke has had quite a lot of attention. I think he's had very good care. Um, so I'm not gonna focus on Luke Smith, but I hope he does very well. Um, <laughs> One of the more common types of injury we sadly see in London is cyclists who are injured. And I notice you've got a lot of bikes in Amsterdam. So for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on one mechanism of injury, and it is pedal cyclist hit by HGV. So this is, about, um, this is the beginning of 2017, and on one particular day, two female pedal cyclists were killed within 24 hours. So for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to use four ladies they all had exactly the same mechanism of injury. They were pedal cyclists, and they were injured by HGVs or large vehicles such as coaches. And they presented as patients over nearly a decade. And from the first one, Mary, on the top left of your screen, um, she was treated a, almost a decade ago. And then the most recent one, Sarah, up on the top right-hand side, was treated only um, recently last year. And I'm going to take you through how they were cared for, just so that you can see how our system has evolved. So this is an un not an unfamiliar scene for our teams to be presented with. Um, you can just see from the single picture what's happened here. Um, as I said, all of these ladies were pedal cyclists hit by the HGV. And this is a still shot of Vicky. And Vicky was actually, um, her medical care was filmed by the BBC, who were um, filming the programme and how to save your life. And you can just see from looking at Vicky here, she is actually GCS 14. Um, she did not have a head injury, she did not have a chest injury. Her reduction in GCS is purely due to hypoperfusion, secondary to hypovolemia. You can see from the color of her compared to the color of the policeman's arm that she is exsanguinating. All of the patients that I've shown you had heart rates between 140 to 160. They have blood pressures between 40 and 50 systolic. And with one exception, they were all able to speak and tell us their names um, and what they'd been doing immediately before the accident. And they were all traveling to or from work on their bikes. So back in 2007, on the left-hand side, you can see the care that the pre-hospital air ambulance team delivered. So there's a doctor paramedic team. They achieved IV access along with the ambulance service. She was given cold saline as a resuscitation fluid. She had a tourniquet placed on one of her legs because she had a degloving injury as well as fractures, but her leg was bleeding from the soft tissue loss. She had splints applied to her fractures. She had blast dressings put to compress hemorrhage. She actually underwent a rapid sequence induction. 
and there's a pre-alert to the big hospital, which happened to be the Royal London Hospital. But back in 2007, there was no trauma centre designation. We were just a big hospital. When she arrived, she had a consultant-led trauma team. She had imaging. She did have a CT scan, and she went to theatre to obtain vascular control. And a massive transfusion pack had been requested, as you would expect. But Mary's problem was she had a, an extended period of profound hypotension, and we weren't able to control non-compressible bleeding until she went to theatre. But that was standard resuscitation. That was good care at the time. Now, we all know we've talked a lot about performance um, over the last couple of days and how to get a good team performance. Um, Chris Hicks gave us advice on how to be good trauma team leaders. But we know that the heart of a good team performance is about the individuals within that team working together. So your staff selection is actually absolutely key. And at London's Air Ambulance, we, our standard crew configuration until very recently was one doctor and one paramedic to deliver medical care. The other members of the team, the pilots, would interact and support the medical team, not doing actual medical intervention. But to ask one doctor and one paramedic to deliver the type of interventions that are common these days is quite a big ask when you compare that to the size of a trauma team to look after somebody this badly injured. So our doctors and paramedics go through a very rigorous sign-off process, which lasts anything between four and six weeks. They go on a seven-day course, which is really hard work, from eight in the morning till six at night, and there's usually some further activity in the pub in the evenings. Um, they go through at least 20 moulages in that week. They learn their standard operating procedures. Every actual mission on the, during their four to six weeks is debriefed in detail. They learn about injury scoring. They're involved in the daily case review of every single case that the service attends. The twice-weekly in-depth case review. And over six months, the average physician who works with us will go to 150 severely injured patients and probably do around 50 pre-hospital rapid sequence inductions. And we know that this volume of experience, along with the training, pushes us closer to getting towards perfect. And we're not saying I am excellent or we are excellent, but we're trying to get to that position as close as we possibly can. Now, one of the areas we really focus on in training is bleeding patients. As I said, it's quite common for our patients to have the type of injuries where they are literally exsanguinating. And we know that the average age of these patients is 34. And prior to 2008, the mortality rate in this group was over 50%, which we all accepted was not good enough. So in 2008, we brought in a code called Code Red. And this was aiming to try and improve the process for these patients. So purely for bleeding patients, not shocked patients who had a tension pneumothorax, who had a spinal injury, but just patients who were bleeding. And it allowed the pre-hospital team to pre-alert the emergency department, which allowed the hospital to get ready. And that was about activating people, processes, and places such as theater and interventional radiology. And the trauma team is pretty well practiced anyway. They're good at ordering tests and blood tests and imaging in advance. But it, this, this was really a step up from the standard trauma team activation. One of the keys was the Code Red had to be a consultant-led team. We had specific action cards and a standard operating procedure for people to follow. And we turned what was a massive transfusion protocol into a massive hemorrhage protocol, which was all the bits around making sure we had senior members of the team, not junior doctors, but senior people who could deliver procedures first time, who were highly competent. And as I said, it was a whole hospital response. One of the other important things we introduced was a formal debrief not immediately after the trauma call, but when the patient had been to theatre, the surgeons were available, the theatre staff had cleared up, and the theatre staff were involved in the debrief. And that would happen towards the end of a 12-hour shift. Generally, a pager would go out and everybody would come to the ED seminar room to have that conversation and debrief. In 2010, the London Major Trauma System was established, and these big hospitals turned into major trauma centres. Four were designated, one in each quadrant of London, and they had trauma units which they would support. But the important thing about the major trauma system was that the ambulance service was absolutely key, not only in dispatching ambulances and air ambulances to the patients, but also in deciding where they would go. So the London Ambulance Service triage tool helps the paramedics and technicians decide which hospital the patient um, would need to go to, and would they benefit from a major trauma centre. And this London major trauma system, within a year, was estimated to have saved 53 additional lives. 
There was no change in clinical practice or process. This was purely organisational, just getting people used to taking patients to a big hospital with resources which had protocols. And you can see here this paper published in 2016 showed other benefits as well. So it's really about making sure that what looks like an effective trauma team, and this is a real call, they all look very happy and relaxed and smiley, but you can tell it's a real call because actually there is blood and plasma loaded into the level one fluid warmer. But you can see they're quite calm, but they look like they're ready for action. But the key is, can they really turn it into um, good clinical practice? And this is perhaps more realistic of what a code red trauma call actually looks like. So the next innovation that really came was in 2012. So you remember I said that Mary, who was treated in 2007, only had pre-hospital crystalloid, and she required quite a large volume to support her blood pressure. So as pre-hospital physicians, we felt there was a real gap for these patients. We weren't happy giving them crystalloid. There was lots of evidence coming out to say that bleeding patients should be giving blood products earlier. And because of logistical constraints, it actually took us quite a long time to be able to get blood out of the hospital into boxes for us to use. And we had support from the military in doing that. But what we showed from, we audited three years before we had blood um, on board and three years afterwards, and we showed that we were significantly able to reduce the pre-hospital mortality. It didn't equate to a survival to discharge from hospital, and actually what it means is that those patients are surviving to hospital, but the hospital performance then has to be enhanced in order for these patients to be able to um, be discharged successfully. So obviously the patients like the four ladies have all got pelvic fractures from having the HGV go over their pelvis. And as I said, none of them had head or chest injuries. They were all injured below the waist. It won't be lost on anybody here that if you have a severely fractured pelvis, the arteries and the veins are involved, and yet actually there's very little you can do to compress that hemorrhage in the pre-hospital environment. Now, if you're in an emergency department, you can obviously prove the diagnosis by doing plain film imaging, and you can rapidly have an idea of what's going on. We don't do that in pre-hospital. We're literally using our clinical acumen to try and work out from the mechanism and looking at the patient what type of pelvic fracture they've actually got. But in all of these cases, it's very obvious to the clinicians involved that these patients had um, severe fractures of their pelvis. So again, if you're in hospital, you've got a whole team to help provide the care. You've got a blood bank with lots of unlimited blood products usually. And you've got the choice of whether you might go to interventional radiology or whether the patient needs to go to theatre for damage control surgery. Pre-hospitally, what can we do? Well, put a pelvic binder on. And for Mary, she had a pelvic binder, she had tourniquets, she had crystalloid, but it didn't really feel like it was enough, but that was standard care. So the doctor who looked after her is actually a chap called Sammy Sadek, and this is him in the picture here. Um, he looked after Mary, and he felt that there was more we needed to do. So we worked towards delivering Reboa. Now, I don't think Reboa is currently practiced in the Netherlands, having talked to some of you, but you will have read papers about it. I may be wrong, there may be some places that do. Um, but it's certainly been used um, a long time ago in the UK, particularly for um, obstetric hemorrhage and other um, sources of major bleeding, but it sort of went out of practice for the last 50 years. Some countries like Japan and, the, and America, they've been doing it extensively for a while, but in 2013, we brought it into the emergency department practice. And for those of you who aren't familiar, it's effectively putting in a balloon catheter through the femoral artery, blowing the balloon up in the aorta and cutting the blood supply off below the level of the balloon. And we currently do it at zone three, which is just below the renal arteries. So for patients like Mary um, and Vicky and Sarah, you can imagine that it's going, to, it's going to temporarily halt the exsanguinating hemorrhage below the level of the renal arteries. But clearly, it's like putting a tourniquet on the aorta and it has complications and it's risky. But Sammy was the first doctor to do it in our emergency department, and I think he was particularly delighted that the BBC happened to be filming that day. So the whole event was filmed, and fortunately the patient had a good outcome. But this is him, and you can see how much simultaneous activity is going on in this call, but Sammy is like eyes down, doing that procedure, getting that um, balloon catheter into the groin. However, Reboa brought challenges with it. Even, we've been doing it now since 2013, and between the pre-hospital team and the emergency department team, we've done less than 20 in five years. We've been very careful about the patients we've selected, but because it's an infrequent procedure, there's been quite a steep learning curve. Um, there's concerns each individual doesn't feel like they really have a huge amount of expertise because the case numbers are low. It requires very different teamwork because 
It's a different type of trauma call. We, don't we do simulate it fairly often, but actually the team doesn't do it for real that often. And we're all aware that there are complications attached to this procedure. It also caused a little bit of rivalry amongst teams about who would actually put the catheter in. And obviously, different um, teams have different skill sets. For example, anaesthesia and intensive care are probably putting femoral arterial lines in more frequently than emergency physicians. But emergency physicians in our system, consultants are, pre are present 24 hours a day, which provides an advantage logistically. We also had some problems with engagement in that some of the surgeons didn't believe that this was necessary to do in a hospital when we had an operating theatre ready and available and felt that actually we should just be going to theatre rather than doing this. And we had to manage people's um, issues with lack of confidence and anxiety about having to, or being asked to provide this procedure. So it just shows that when you bring in a new procedure, you really have to work very hard on the culture and engagement and actually training people to believe that they can deliver this. Even if they know it's right for the patient, they want to feel confident in doing it. Now, these are some of our trauma surgeons. Um, we have an amazing group of trauma surgeons who all happen to be vascular surgeons as well. Um, down the left is Pete Bates, one of our pelvic orthopedic surgeons. And they've been very supportive. And actually, we've evolved the protocol for Oboa so that now the first operator is a consultant interventional radiologist in the hospital. And the second, if that fails, the, um, the consultant surgeons will do an open technique. And that works very well, as I said, because they're all vascular consultants anyway. So if we move forward to 2014, um, and Vicky is a patient who was treated in 2014, we'd actually moved Reboa out into the pre-hospital setting. We were the first service to deliver this procedure out of hospital. We were also we were warming the packed red blood cells that we were carrying. So you can see the difference for Vicky was that she got warmed packed red blood cells for resuscitation. She was given tranexamic acid because that had become a standard of care to be given within the first three hours and is given by the ambulance service most of the time. And she got zone three pre-hospital Reboa. Vicky did undergo an RSI as well. And the code red pre-alert was placed to the major trauma center. The difference in the hospital was that there's a full team Reboa response led by an emerg a consultant emergency physician. At this point in time, thawed plasma was now available in the lab rather than having frozen plasma, which had to be thawed, causing a delay. We have an embedded research team who come and take bloods on every trauma patient so that they're recruited into a whole variety of trials, mostly on coagulopathy. But as I said, the results from those trials are rapidly translated into updating our massive hemorrhage protocol. And we also had introduced Rotem guided resuscitation. So you can see that already there's been a step up in the, in the level of care. So we talked quite a lot yesterday about trauma team preparation. I completely agree with what Chris said about accepting people into your team, introducing them, briefing, and actually having that slight hold, like the, um, the runner on the start line, are we ready? Has everyone got everything they need? Are we good to go? I think that's really important. Now, one of the problems is when you're doing 3,600 trauma calls a year, your teams get very tired. And actually, then all your patients are not as badly injured as these four ladies. So what we decided to do in 2015 was to break the trauma calls down into tiers. So not every patient required an anaesthetist or an operating department practitioner. So for the lower level calls where people had an injury but weren't physiologically compromised or didn't have major anatomical injury, we had a standard adult trauma call. Then for someone whose physiology was deranged or perhaps had an actual injury, like a fracture, they would have an advanced trauma call and code red for bleeding patients and code black was introduced for traumatic brain injury. Um, those two codes got very senior, very experienced teams. And that's worked well. It's, pre it's prevented fatigue and frustration in the team members who weren't needed for the lower acuity calls. So there's still a little bit of struggle going on with Reboa. Some surgeons weren't completely on side, didn't particularly want to be involved with doing Reboa. So we decided to take a step not backwards, but perhaps on a slightly different path. And we decided to move from the position where we were doing Reboa and everyone who we thought needed it to going into the UK Reboa trial. So quite a lot of us have equipoise on whether Reboa is a good thing or a bad thing. But for each patient that is eligible to have Reboa, where we believe that we're not sure whether Reboa is right or wrong or will benefit the patient, we're now recruiting them into the UK trial, which will decide whether they get standard um, treatment or whether they have a Reboa catheter inserted. And at some point this year, we will hopefully move to zone one Reboa in the hospital, which is putting the balloon up into the thoracic aorta. Now, three of the patients were talking at scene and were able to tell us their names. 
one of the patients had a traumatic cardiac arrest. And our protocol currently is if the patient goes into traumatic arrest, we don't attempt Reboa, but we do a thoracotomy. So sadly, our team is quite experienced at doing thoracotomies, usually for penetrating trauma. And at the moment, we're doing between one and two thoracotomies a week, usually for young victims of stabbing. But when we started carrying blood, we realised that actually there was potential to improve our pre-hospital vascular control. So we started to do thoracotomies on blunt trauma patients where we felt that if we could put our hand on the aorta and apply manual occlusion, volume load the patient with blood and do internal massage, if we could restart the heart, that would be a positive sign and would allow us to try and get the patient to hospital for damage control surgery below the diaphragm. So it makes sense. It sounded like it was going to work. And I, in particular, was a fan. I thought this would help patients. But if you look at the international blunt thoracotomy data, it is woeful, or the outcomes are woeful. Um, and we looked at 10 years of our patients, pre-hospital and in hospital at the Royal London. And for those who were in traumatic arrest and had a blunt, a thoracotomy for blunt trauma, there was not one pre-hospital survivor in the last decade. We have had one prior to that, but in the last decade, we didn't have any. There's also no emergency department survivors for patients who had extra thoracic injuries. And the only survivors from ED or theater um, thoracotomies were patients who had had cardiac injuries from blunt force trauma. So a fractured rib had penetrated the heart and caused a tamponade, for example. So we had a consensus meeting with surgeons, intensivists, emergency physicians, and we decided that in our institution we would stop doing blunt thoracotomy for hemorrhage that was outside the thoracic cavity. At the same time, we also tripled the number of consultants working for London's Air Ambulance. And actually, I think this is probably one of the most significant milestones for the service for several reasons. So we had five consultants for quite a long time, and then we increased to 16. And what this has allowed us to do is to deliver two doctors with a paramedic to each London's Air Ambulance patient. And if you think about the procedures that we're asking them to do, to do rapid sequence induction, put in a trauma line, do Reboa, do a thoracotomy. It's quite a lot to ask, certainly a doctor and a paramedic, and it's still a lot to ask two doctors and a paramedic to do quickly. Because we do believe these patients need to be in hospital and time is of the essence. But if you look at trauma resuscitation for this type of injury in 2018, so Sarah was injured in 2018, a three-person team pre-hospitally, warmed red cells and plasma, so we're now carrying a blood product that in a single bag we have red cells and plasma, which logistically is much easier for a pre-hospital team than having several bags of different products. And the rest of the treatment was pretty standard. So zone three Reboa, but Sarah didn't have an anaesthetic, she was kept awake. I think we've recognized that some of these patients, there is an advantage to keeping them awake until we get them to hospital. She had a code red Reboa alert, and then the in the hospital, all the work we've done on Reboa has really been ramped up. So consultant level Reboa response, including interventional radiology consultants, a very detailed SOP, not just for the resuscitation room, but for ongoing care of the catheter and the sheath when it should be taken out, how to manage taking the balloon down, very detailed instructions for the rest of the hospital. Rotem guided resuscitation is now standard practice, not just for research. And there's a Reboa working group who review every single patient in detail, not just how the balloon went in, but all of the care right up to discharge. And importantly, we have a capability in our sister hospital. We now have an ECMO team. And it's not embedded in our practice yet, but there's the option to have a conversation about whether a patient would benefit from going on ECMO. So how has this all come together? Well, you can see from this graph, if we go back to 2008, in 2007, the mortality exceeded 50% for this group of patients. In 2008, it came down quite rapidly to below 40%. And if you look at the, the black bars are patients who died within the first three hours after admission to hospital. There's no pre-hospital deaths included. This is all in hospital data. So as you can see, each innovation has been, um, it has got an arrow above it. We saw a reduction in the overall mortality but in 2012, when we introduced pre-hospital blood, you can see that the early deaths in hospital went up, the black bars increased in size. And if you're wondering what's happened in 2017 and 2018, it's about to be published, which is why I haven't put it in, but it is going in the right direction. 
So our clinical governance, I mentioned the increase in pre-hospital care consultants. This has allowed us to do a lot of work on separate projects from clinical processes to looking um, at staff wellbeing, et cetera. But it's allowed us to, to deliver even more clinical governance. We have a huge number of SOPs, both clinical and logistical. And we have an education program, which in the hospital includes monthly full trauma team simulation. We have for pre-hospital the daily rapid review meeting and um, we also introduced a clinico-pathological meeting which is when we have a, um, a pathologist come and tell us actually what our patients did die of. As someone mentioned, I think we get it wrong 30% of the time. It's really interesting to see what the post-mortem report is for the patient you thought had a certain type of injury and we get some interesting surprises. And in the hospital we have regular mortality meetings and um, quarterly trauma board where any recurrent issues are discussed. So this is Vicky. So Vicky clearly made it through her trauma, and this is her in, on the trauma ward after she's left intensive care. So you can see she's alive, but you can also see from her face that the hard work for her is yet to come. So in 2017, we established an after-trauma team, which is a group of nurses, trauma nurse coordinators and rehab coordinators. They've all been very experienced, senior sisters, organ transplant coordinators, and these ladies key work for the patients. They go and talk to them, they can advise them about getting pro bono legal advice, about how to get benefits. They advise about charities that can support them with regard to their specific injuries. And they can help their families and relatives come to terms with what's happened and how, uh, explain how they're going to navigate their journey. We also set up an after trauma website, which is like an online community for patients who've been injured so they can talk to people who had similar injuries. And we set up an app which allows people to actually monitor their own recovery and do some, um, do some rehabilitation at home using different um, aspects of the app. London Zoo Ambulance employs a patient liaison nurse who will go to any of the four major trauma centres and follow patients up and will also go to their homes and help support their recovery. We've been talking about the patients a lot, but the other group is, of course, the staff. So going to this type of event and having to walk away from an unsuccessful resuscitation takes its toll. And actually in 2017, London Zoo Ambulance was involved with all of the major incidents in London, from Westminster, London Bridge. And away from terror attacks, the Grenfell Tower was perhaps, Grenfell Tower fire was perhaps an event which upset more staff than the, than the terror events did. And you can see here, obviously, that wasn't just medical staff, but other emergency services were affected too. So a big piece of work that we're trying to do now is how do we provide psychological support for our teams, which allows them to keep doing their jobs. So this is Mary. Um, so Mary did survive her accident, but she ended up having a massive transfusion. She had cerebral edema. She had a decompressive craniectomy. Um, she remains alive, but she's ventilated. She's GCS6 and has a tracheostomy. But she was a Times journalist. So her case actually escalated the problem with cycling in London and meant that there was then significant support for creating cycle superhighways and having injury prevention schemes. And we have a team which does work particularly on violence and stabbings. Carla was one of the two ladies that died. She had the traumatic arrest, pre-hospital thoracotomy, a trauma line, four units of blood. They got ROSC, they brought her to hospital. She survived five hours in the operating theatre. And she was the lady who made me believe that we should, have, we should have an ECMO capability for trauma patients. They corrected her coagulopathy, she'd had damage control surgery, she'd stopped bleeding, but they couldn't keep her heart going. The metabolic insult was too great. And fortunately, Vicky and Sarah both survived. Um, they both had above knee amputations on the left-hand side. Um, Vicky's gone back to work and she now works for a charity called Road Peace. And Sarah's just gone back to work, and Sarah's literally only about five months post-accident. You can just see how amazing she looks. So I think what this journey has taught us is that every single patient matters. And whether you view each case, whatever happens, whether it's seen as a success or a failure, each case gives us opportunities to learn lessons, refine processes, adapt our systems, bond teams together, and practice real heartfelt medicine. So I think you've all been at the conference for two days, you've all worked hard to learn, and I hope that everyone's able to take something home. And I think you can see from the patients here that actually we can t keep taking little steps towards improving not just ourselves, but our services and the care for patients. Thank you.